want to start out wishing everyone a happy Easter and I hope you enjoy this time with your your uh, family as we get older our family starts to shrink and they have gone to heaven ahead of us and so we need to work hard so we can get to heaven too and stay connected to the family now as we look at the liturgy and what it teaches us one of the lines in the liturgy is in dying you destroy our death and rising you restore our life Lord Jesus come in glory so let's think about that for a minute the Pharisees thought they had a victory over Jesus and the crucifixion from the physical perspective would appear to be a victory over Jesus but on the spiritual level it was the exact opposite it was the victory of Jesus over the serpent and one of the things I like about Mel Gibson's movie The Passion of Christ is how when Jesus dies there's a teardrop presumably from God the Father coming down from heaven and when it hits the figure that represents Satan begins to scream the Pharisees don't because they haven't figured out what's coming yet but the death of Jesus is the greatest moment in human history it is the moment that our sins are atoned for and the debt is paid and we now have a chance to return to paradise as Jesus was on the cross he said to the good thief today you'll be with me in paradise so as we follow what happens of course the resurrection is obviously a physical and spiritual victory and that's you know when the Pharisees get really upset because when the soldiers who are a third party disinterested show up and say uh, we got a problem there Caiaphas uh, the angels showed up and we're not about to fight angels we we don't have the equipment to deal with these guys that shine like lightning and roll back the stone and sit on it it says in scripture they became like dead men the mighty Roman legions you know there was probably about 160 of them there with swords ready if the disciples they probably calculated out if the disciples come and bring friends we're going to be ready for anything so they weren't ready for the angel they weren't ready for Christ to rise from the dead so the Pharisees now have a special moment where they can say okay we got it wrong we need to repent and accept Jesus as the Messiah that's not what they do they double down in the hardness of their hearts and they tell the soldiers all right we're going to give you a whole lot of money you go and you tell everyone that you fell asleep and the disciples came and stole the body and if Pontius Pilate hears about it we will clear it up for you because you know what happens if you're a Roman soldier and you fall asleep on guard duty you merely get executed for that so that's what they were scared of so the disinformation as it were the lie the controlling of the message by the serpent and his assistance begins the denial of the resurrection paid for by the Pharisees and distributed through the Roman soldiers that he didn't really rise from the dead but did it work no the truth still comes out and you know uh, the successors of the Pharisees are this little thing called social media which sounds so innocent you know social media was that two people talking sounds nice well it's more than that there's a lot of aspects of social media that are under control of the serpent and so they attack the family the attack on God on the church on uh, mothers and fathers and children in the womb and outside of the womb the natural order of the family established by God of a man and a woman all under attack in our modern world and where do you think it comes from hell that's where it comes from 
Where else would an attack on mothers and fathers and babies inside the womb and outside the womb attack on God and the church come from? So as we look at what happens, we see the persecution of the church. And in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul, who has supported the execution and martyrdom of St. Stephen, and is increasing the persecution of the church, on his road to Damascus, Jesus shows up and knocks him off the horse with blinding light. And he says, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, well, who are you? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. So what was he doing? Was he persecuting Jesus? He was attacking the church, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the people who were proclaiming Jesus is risen and the gospel. And Jesus took that as an attack on himself. Jesus says in Matthew 25, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, you do unto me. So what do you think is going to happen to the modern successors of the Pharisees, the deniers of the resurrection, the attackers of the church, the attackers of the truth of the church, the attackers of the family of God? But that says a family is a man, a woman, and a baby. They're in big trouble. And so they think they are winning because they have such power in the media, but they're not. They're destroying themselves and their soul in the process because these little weasels that hide behind the internet with their little attacks eventually, because everything that you see on the internet and the news and the media, wherever, that attacks God, attacks the church, attacks the teaching of the church, attacks mothers and fathers and family units, children, they will have to answer. What does Jesus say? I will hold you accountable for every idle word that you speak. Man is held accountable for every idle word. So I gotta even worry about my idle words, especially with New Jersey vocabulary. So, now think about these guys that are directly, intentionally attacking God, the family, mothers, fathers, children, and the church. Not good for them, because the way God has it set up, the more they attack us, the stronger we get, and the more they destroy themselves. So the persecutors of the church, the ones that killed the Christians, that didn't repent before they died, where are they now? How are they doing in eternity? Not so good. And so it's important for us to make our stand. We are either with the Pharisees, yelling crucify him, mocking him, mocking the teaching of the church and, and, and the family, and, and, and purity and all these things that the, the world loves to attack in the movies and the media. Or we are there next to Christ with Saint Dismas on the cross being persecuted. There's no third option. We're either with them or with Christ on the cross. And so it's important for us to stand with Christ. Christ promises that if we deny him before men, he will deny us before the Father in heaven and the angels when he comes. But if we acknowledge him before men, he will acknowledge us with God the Father and the angels when he comes at the end. So the victory of Christ on the cross is the destruction of the dead of sin. And so our souls are cleansed because we only get one soul. Now we get a new body at the resurrection, but the same soul the soul is cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. It says in, in uh, Revelation, we will walk following the Lamb in white robes. That's one of the reasons I wear this white robe, the alb. Washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. So the resurrection of Christ is our resurrection. Because when he came out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, he is the first man of the new world. Remember when God created Adam, it was a new world. And that was the beginning, that was paradise, the Garden of Eden. Jesus says in the scripture, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. St. Peter says the old one will be destroyed by fire in his epistle. So the first man, the firstborn of the dead, the first man of the new world is the new Adam, Christ. Mary is the new Eve, our spiritual mother. And so we want to be part of the new world. The new heaven and the new earth, the new paradise that was won for us by the precious blood of Christ, every drop that he shed for love of us. 
And the resurrection, when he comes out of the tomb, that's our resurrection. That's our hope, of, that's our new life. So that we become one with him, then on the, on the last day we will rise from the dead. And we will have glorified bodies like his. Now the bad guys, they got a problem. You look in the book of Daniel, it says that those who lead the people astray from God will arise in everlasting horror and disgrace. So, you know, some of you may have watched that silly show, the, what is it, The Walking Dead, The Wandering Dead, you know, they wander in and out of Atlanta, apparently. So, but in any event, those are fake zombies, but the real ones are coming, the bodies of the damned, the opposite of the glorified body of the saved. The bodies of the saved will be beautiful, youthful, healthy forever, never to die, incapable of suffering pain, filled with light. Guess what the bodies of the damned are? The opposite, filled with darkness, ugliness, separation from God, a physical manifestation of the darkness and ugliness and evil of sin that has filled their soul by their lifetime choice to reject God and the gospel and the resurrection of Christ. Very frightening for them. And so that's why we need to pray for them. We need to hope for them to change because it, it's a horrible fate. So as we celebrate the resurrection, we need to say, his resurrection is my resurrection. I will share in that resurrection the last day when he calls me forth from the tomb to never die again. How do we do that? By becoming one with him through believing, first of all, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in the resurrection of Christ. Through baptism, the water that flowed from his side on the cross points to the sacrament of baptism. The new birth, the precious blood the, the, that flows from his side pointing to the Holy Communion. So when we receive Holy Communion, our body and blood and his body and blood become one. So we share, we have his resurrected body connected to ours. We have his divinity connected to our humanity through baptism and faith and Holy Communion. And so his Holy Spirit united with our human soul. That's the beauty of the sacraments, the beauty of the faith. And the way we maintain it, the way we are ready to live the life of the next world is through a life of daily prayer, a life of humble obedience and submission to God. So the bad guys have a problem. They have hardness of heart. I was thinking about it last night at the vigil about Pharaoh and Pharaoh and the Pharisees. What's their problem? Pride and anger. So why, why in his right mind would the Pharaoh have his Egyptian soldiers follow Moses' people down into the bottom of the Red Sea? I mean, you would think, hey, you know, they about wiped out Egypt with the death of the firstborn, the plagues, the darkness, all that stuff, and you want to go after this guy? Because he was filled with rage. When we get angry, we do dumb things. When we get filled with pride, we make stupid and sinful decisions. The best decisions I've ever made in my life has been when I was being patient and humble and asking the Lord for guidance. When we react with doubt, keeping God out of the decision, and we react with passion and anger and pride, without patience, we do dumb things. All you got to do is think about, when have I made big mistakes? Was it connected with faith in God or doubt? Was it connected with pride and anger and patience? No. So, so if we look at the decision process, it's so important for us to maintain faith in God, humility, prayer, patience, so that the decisions we make will help us on the road to heaven and not start to reverse our trip to heaven and turn us back in the direction of the other place. So as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, let's keep in mind that we need to make his resurrection our resurrection. And there's only one way to do it, through humble obedience and uh, being a humble servant of God who prays, who keeps the Ten Commandments and, no and remembers them and lives by them. When we go to confession for sins committed after baptism, restore ourselves, Divine Mercy Sundays, coming up next week. I'll talk a little more about that next week. So 
It's important for us as we celebrate the resurrection to remember our baptismal promises. In a moment, we're going to renew them. The renunciation of Satan and sin. And when I sprinkle you with the holy water, you're supposed to make the sign of the cross. People have been a little confused at the last couple of masses. I'm sprinkling, they just stand. You make the sign of the cross when you get hit with the holy water, okay? Because you're renewing your baptismal promises. To renounce sin and Satan, to an accept belief in God the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, <coughs> and in his holy Catholic Church. So let's do our best to <coughs> benefit from our faith in the resurrection.